Welcome back to Counting to Five, a podcast about the United States Supreme Court. This episode is the first part of a two-part exploration of the Court's unanimous June 19th decision in Matal v. Tam, formerly known as Lee v. Tam, the case about the Asian American rock band The Slants and their battle with the PTO to trademark their band name. More on that in a moment, but first a quick update about the conclusion of the term. Coming into the second half of June, the court still had decisions outstanding in 17 argued cases. On Monday, June 19th, the court handed down decisions in five of those cases. The court took the bench again on Thursday, June 22nd, and Friday, June 23rd, handing down three additional opinions each day. And finally, on Monday, June 26th, the court concluded its term by issuing decisions in four more argued cases. If you did the math, that only adds up to 15 cases, not 17. And that's because the court was deadlocked 4-4 to in two cases, both of which will now be re-argued in the fall. Let's talk briefly about those decisions. The story as of mid-June was the high level of agreement on the court, with unanimous decisions and a solid majority of the court's cases. The end of the term is when the court's divisions really revealed themselves. Of the court's 15 decisions and argued cases in the last two weeks of June, only three were unanimous, and each of these involved disagreement among the justices on the reasoning. In another five decisions, the court divided along familiar left-right lines, with Justice Kennedy providing the swing vote, siding with the court's liberals in two and the conservatives in three. And of course, as I mentioned, there were two cases where the court was equally divided. As we continue into the summer, we'll be looking back at more of the court's opinions and looking ahead to the cases on the docket next term. But right now, we're going to dig into one of the court's recent unanimous, though not unified, decisions in Matal v. Tam. As I mentioned at the top of the episode, this is the first part of a two-part examination of the case. In the next episode, we're going to analyze the legal arguments and the justices' opinions in the case and consider what the decision means going forward. But in this episode, we're going to do something a little different. Instead of just focusing on law, in this episode we're going to spend some time considering the broader cultural context. We'll look at how the case got started and how it ended up in front of the Supreme Court, but more importantly, we're going to try to understand where Simon Tam and the Slants fit into ongoing debates and conversations about race and offensive speech. Let's get started. Here's the case in a single sentence. Can the Patent and Trademark Office refuse to register a trademark for an Asian American rock band when that band's name is also an offensive racial slur against Asians? Let's start at the beginning with Simon Tam and the Slants. In 2006, Simon Tam, a Chinese American bass player, decided to form a band and began recruiting fellow Asian Americans to join him. Tam called his band the Slants, deliberately playing off a derogatory term for people of East Asian heritage. Why call the band the Slants? Here's Tam speaking in an interview with Reason Magazine earlier this year. So I wanted to not be the token guy in the band anymore. I wanted to start my own band that would just kind of celebrate that culture. And that's when I got the idea of starting this Asian American kind of project. Um, now, th throughout that process, I started asking people like, hey, uh, what's something you think all Asians have in common? I'm trying to think of a band name here. And they told me, Slanted Eyes. And I thought, you know, that's really interesting because number one, it's, it's not true. But number two, we can use it and talk about our slant on life of, as people of color. And number three, it sounds like, uh, you know, the kind of a band Debbie Harry would front. So I was like, this is perfect. And so then we became the Slants. And here's Tam's take on the idea of repurposing an offensive term. The name has never been provocative. I, th I actually thought it was kind of funny. I thought, okay, we can kind of flip this slur around uh, and do like a positive, self-empowering kind of thing with the word. But that being said, like I had never been called a slant my whole life. I've been called many other things, <laughs> uh, all sorts of colorful words that people can think of for Asian Americans. Uh, but slant was one, one of them. So I thought this is kind of a clever, fun take on it. There are several interesting things going on here. First, Tam and the slants are an illustration of the difference between in-group and outsider use of racial slurs and other derogatory terms. The effect of a potential derogatory term often depends crucially on who is using it. When Tam, an Asian American, uses the word slant self-referentially, it may be perceived as tongue-in-cheek or ironic or irreverent, but it is unlikely to be interpreted as conveying racial animus or hatred. Even a reviled racial or ethnic slur, when used self-referentially or toward members of one's own group, for example, the so-called N-word when used by African Americans, will be viewed very differently from the same word used by an outsider. 
A second effect that may be at work is a generational shift in attitudes about particular terms. Words and phrases, including insults and slurs, come in and out of common use over time, and this has an impact on how they're perceived. Tam mentions never having personally experienced the word slant used as a slur. Similarly, many young Italian Americans have never personally encountered epithets like WAP or DAGO outside of an ironic or self-deprecating context, leading some to view these words as, at worst, humorously dated, rather than seriously insulting. Of course, shifts like this may lead to generational divides over the offensiveness of particular terms. Finally, and perhaps most interestingly, Tam talks about flipping the slur around. This is sometimes called reappropriation or reclamation, when members of a group attempt to reduce or erase the negative connotation of a word or phrase by using it in a positive or self-affirming way. Proponents of this kind of reappropriation argue that when the targeted group embraces a formerly pejorative term, this takes the sting out of it and effectively removes a weapon from the bigot's arsenal. Perhaps the clearest example of a successful reappropriation is with the word queer, which for most of the 20th century was a clearly derogatory term for gay or effeminate men. In the 1990s, certain gay and lesbian activists engaged in a conscious and deliberate effort to reclaim the word as a positive self-descriptor. Their success was eventually so complete that queer as a neutral label for persons with non-traditional gender or sexual identities has largely displaced the pejorative usage. Today, there are queer studies programs at major universities and a popular early 2000s television show playing off of stereotypes about stylish and fastidious gay men and heterosexual slobs was called Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. Similar attempts at reappropriation have been made by members of all manner of maligned groups, with varying degrees of success. But can a word like slants be rehabilitated? What is and is not offensive or disparaging often seems completely arbitrary, and typically has far more to do with accidents of history than anything inherent in the words. There's no logical reason that the Yiddish word for a Jew and the Polish word for a Pole, when borrowed directly into English, should have become derogatory ethnic slurs, but they did. And it's not obvious that a word like queer, which has always had connotations of abnormality and strangeness, could become a neutral or positive label. But what about terms derived from physical characteristics? The racial term slant, short for slant eye, refers to the stereotypical East Asian eye shape. There is a real physical basis. Certain anatomical features, including an uncreased upper eyelid and a skin feature known as the epicanthic fold, both of which are very common among East Asians, but less so among many other world populations, result in eye shapes that differ from those typical of most Europeans. But the term slant not only lumps together all East Asians, not all of whom share a single stereotypical eye shape, but also labels East Asians with a crude, exaggerated description of a single superficial feature. It's easy to see why this might be offensive. But then, consider the term black referring to persons of African ancestry. Here again, we have a crude, exaggerated description of a stereotypical superficial feature. And in America, there's also an ugly history of minstrel shows and cartoon caricatures portraying African Americans with coal black faces instead of realistic skin tones. In the late 1980s, civil rights leader Jesse Jackson referred to the use of the word black as baseless and urged, along with other activists, that it be replaced by the term African American. But despite its history and its inaccuracy as a description, the word black has largely been embraced by African Americans and has been used proudly from the black power movement of the 60s and 70s to the current Black Lives Matter movement. So far, the word slant has not been similarly embraced by the Asian American community, and perhaps it never will be. But again, consider the Black is Beautiful movement of the 1960s, which, among other things, pushed back against the use of skin lightening products in pursuit of what was considered a white standard of beauty. One could imagine a reappropriation of the term slant in service of a similar movement pushing back against the eyelid surgery popular in many Asian communities, which results in more stereotypically Western eyes. Whether terms are offensive is in large part arbitrary. It's also impermanent. Terms like queer can be rescued, but once acceptable terms can also fall into disfavor. The words Negro and colored, both formerly accepted terms for African Americans, and still present in the names of venerable institutions like the United Negro College Fund and the NAACP, are now likely to be perceived as antiquated at best and probably offensive. This makes any attempt to define offensive speech a complicated endeavor, especially when that speech is intended to endure over long periods of time, like a trademark. Before we move on, let's consider one final complication. Whose opinion counts? In any large group of people, there are bound to be a wide range of views. Different life experiences, different temperaments, and different strategic calculations will cause people to draw lines in different places. This may result in generational divides, or perhaps in a divide between elite and grassroots opinion. 
This was arguably the case with Jesse Jackson's call to abandon the word black, which never really caught on among the broader black public. This has been an issue in the controversy over the Washington Redskins football team. Native American advocacy groups have been uniformly opposed to the continued use of the Redskins name, which they call racist and offensive. A widespread consensus that the name is pejorative has led a number of media organizations to avoid using it, referring to it instead with circumlocutions like the Washington Professional Football Team. But multiple polls conducted over the last two decades, including a 2016 poll by the Washington Post, have found that large majorities of self-identified Native Americans, including those with formal tribal affiliations, do not find the term redskin disrespectful. Some opponents of the name have questioned the poll methodology, but others have argued that regardless of the beliefs of a majority of Native Americans, the name is nevertheless unacceptably offensive. We haven't even discussed the law yet, but it's important to have these cultural debates in mind to understand why efforts to regulate offensiveness may be much more complicated than they at first seem. Let's now return to the slants story. When Simon Tam applied for a trademark for the slants, his application was rejected as disparaging under Section 2A of the Lanham Act, the primary law governing trademarks. Section 2A prohibits registration of, among other things, any matter, quote, which may disparage or falsely suggest a connection with persons living or dead, institutions, beliefs, or national symbols, or bring them into contempt or disrepute. Tam appealed this denial to the PTO's Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. Tam argued that the word slants, as used by the band, was not disparaging, but he also argued that even if it were, denying trademark registration for this reason violates the First Amendment's guarantee of freedom of speech. The board rejected Tam's argument and affirmed the application denial. The board considered Tam's Section 2A disparagement denial under a two-part test. First, the board sought to determine the meaning of the proposed mark, taking into account the context in which it is used. And second, the board asked whether that meaning is disparaging to, quote, a substantial composite of an identifiable group of persons. The board noted that one definition of the word slant is a person of Asian descent, and found that in the context of a band, and specifically a band made up of Asian Americans, the name the slants would convey this meaning. The association of the name slant with Asians was also demonstrated by negative reactions to the band's name from some groups. In considering whether slants is disparaging to a substantial composite of Asians, the board stated that Tam's intent in using the name and the fact that the band's members and some others of Asian descent approve of the name is irrelevant. Citing various dictionary definitions marking the word as offensive and media references to the band's name being derived from a slur, the board found that slants was indeed disparaging. Finally, the board spent all of three sentences addressing Tam's First Amendment argument, quickly concluding that because the refusal to register Tam's trademark doesn't actually prevent him from using the term, there's no abridgment of his First Amendment rights. Tam then appealed the board's denial to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, where the case is known as In Re Tam. That's law Latin for In the Matter of Tam. As is typical in the Federal Circuit Courts, a panel of three judges heard the appeal. They affirmed the application denial, finding no First Amendment violation, based on a 1981 case called In Re McGinley, which held that trademark registration denials don't implicate the First Amendment. Three judge panels of the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals are bound by their own precedents, or in the case of McGinley, by a precedent from the Court of Customs and Patent Appeals, which was the predecessor court to the current Federal Circuit. So the court decision in Tam's case was dictated by In Re McGinley. This decision, however, was accompanied by a separate opinion by one of the judges on the panel, arguing at length that In Re McGinley should be overruled because it was inconsistent with current First Amendment doctrine. A circuit court of appeals can overrule its prior precedent when it sits en banc, that is, when a case is heard by all the judges in the circuit rather than just a three-judge panel, and the federal circuit ordered en banc rehearing of the case to consider the First Amendment issue. The result was a new federal circuit decision, a majority opinion joined by nine of the court's 12 judges, along with four separate concurrences and dissents, totaling 110 pages, a far cry from the three sentences devoted to the First Amendment in the original Trademark Trial and Appeal Board opinion. The majority found Section 2A's disparagement provision unconstitutional and vacated the board's opinion denying TAM's application. At this point, after this reversal of fortune at the Federal Circuit, the PTO, then headed by Michelle Lee, petitioned the Supreme Court to hear the case. The court accepted the case under its new name, Lee v. TAM. And that's where we're going to leave it for now. The Federal Circuit put the First Amendment issues in play, declaring the disparagement provision unconstitutional, and now the case was in the Supreme Court's hands.
Thank you, counsel. The case is submitted. Next episode, we're going to look at the various First Amendment arguments that were made to the Supreme Court. We'll walk through the court's decision affirming the Federal Circuit and striking down the disparagement provision as unconstitutional, and we'll consider what this means for trademark law and the First Amendment going forward. And that brings us to the end of Episode 10. Links to resources related to this episode can be found in the show notes at countingto5.com. That's T-O and the number 5. We welcome your feedback. You can leave a comment on the show notes post at countingto5.com or on the Counting to 5 Facebook page, tweet at Counting to 5, or send an email to mike at countingto5.com. You can call and leave questions and comments on the Counting to 5 voicemail line at 774-226-8685. That's 774-2-COUNT-5. Your feedback heavily influences which topics we choose to cover in this podcast, and that'll be more true than ever as we move into the court's summer recess, where there's typically little news coming out of the court. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Counting to Five to make sure you don't miss future episodes. If Counting to Five is not available in your podcast app of choice, please let us know and we'll do what we can to get it listed. Finally, in past episodes, I've mentioned Counting to Five's Patreon page. If you're not familiar with Patreon, here's what it's all about. Patreon is a platform that allows content creators, including podcasters like me, to seek direct financial support from listeners like you. How does it work? If you go to Counting to Five's Patreon page at patreon.com slash counting to five, you can make a recurring monthly pledge in any amount starting as low as $1. There's no long-term commitment, and you can discontinue your pledge at any time. Why do we need your financial support? To date, the equipment and hosting costs for Counting to Five have been relatively modest. The time put into researching, writing, recording, and editing this podcast, on the other hand, has been anything but modest. Direct listener support can allow us to cover our costs, and compensate us for our considerable time and energy without needing to rely on intrusive advertising and without making us financially dependent on anyone except you, the listeners. But what do you get out of it? Today, we're officially launching a series of exclusive rewards for our Patreon supporters at a variety of pledge levels starting at $1 per month. These exclusive patron rewards include special mini-podcast episodes explaining everything you need to know about the court and how it operates, touching on everything from case selection through briefing and oral argument to opinion drafting and announcement, and topics like the confirmation process and the special role of the United States Solicitor General at the court. Other rewards include live video chats, bonus audio content not included in the podcast, merchandise, and more. This patron-exclusive content won't affect the Counting to Five podcast, which will continue to be free to download with the same analysis and explanation of the court and its work, but now we'll be offering even more to our most dedicated listeners. Please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash counting to five to see the complete list of patron rewards. I hope you'll pitch in to help us. Every little bit helps. Thank you for listening. This has been Counting to Five.